Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. We have been looking at the Apostle Peter's second missionary trip as it relates to what took place in the city of Philippi. And as we begin this morning, I want to bring your attention to something Paul asked the parishioners in the church at Colossae to do for him and his companions. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. Notice the second thing Paul asked prayer for is to be delivered from evil and wicked men, because not everybody has faith. The Greek word for this uh, is translated in the King James Version as unreasonable which means improper or insolent, injurious, or violent, raging, or to do evil to a person. And the word wicked obviously means vicious and evil pertaining to morally corrupt and immorally evil. Paul knew that there would be opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew what wicked and evil men were capable of doing. After all, before his conversion, Paul violently opposed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is hard to reconcile how evil men can inflict so much pain and even death to God's servants, even when they think they are defending God. But we see this evil attitude, it goes all the way back to Cain when he killed his brother after the fall of his parents, Adam and Eve. And again, he went to worship God. One day a worshiper, the next day a murderer. As Paul stated, not everyone has faith, and this tr truth is seen in what takes place all over the world today, especially against Christians. So we looked a couple of weeks ago at, at the event Luke wrote about concerning a demon-possessed slave girl in the city of Philippi. The evil spirit within her uh, could predict future things. In, in other words, she was a, a fortune teller who made her masters a lucrative living. We also saw that Paul, in the name of Jesus, cast out that demon. He set her, the Lord set her free. And we will now look at what took place after her deliverance. It says, but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Now these men appealed to the magistrates. Each Roman colony was governed by two rulers. The charge that these men brought against Paul and Silas was incriminating that they were basing this off of something that took place previously in Rome. Back in Acts 18, 1 and 2, is after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Claudius being uh, one of the rulers, the emperors at that time. Because Philippi was a Roman colony, there would already be a distrust for and even a hatred towards the Jews because of their faith. The words that set off the multitude were these men being Jews. And if you notice, Timothy and Luke are not mentioned in these events, Timothy being half Gentile and Luke being a Gentile, it gives us some clarity as to why they were not accosted. Furthermore, Paul and Silas 
were accused of disturbing the peace, disturbing the city, the Pax Romana uh, or Romana, by advocating customs unlawful for. In other words, Romans, they couldn't accept or practice these because what, G, what, what Paul was teaching was that no one could come to, to God but through the Son. It was an exclusive message and very offensive so Rome permitted the people of its colonies to have their own religions, but not to proselytize Roman citizens. So the civil leaders could not distinguish between Judaism and Christianity. So they would see the preaching of Paul and Silas as a fragment, or I'm sorry, as a flagrant infraction of imperial law. But you have to understand that many gods were being worshiped at this time. Many people were in spiritual bondage and many people were held captive in their minds by deception and by the devil. In 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. The enemy, he's crafty, he's cunning. He may have been cast out of the slave girl's light, but he held power over the un unregenerate minds of the men in this city of Philippi. Which brings us to letter A, a person's physical opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ reveals their spiritual enslavement. Say this again. A person's physical opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ reveals their spiritual enslavement. It says, then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. So you can imagine that the city got into an uproar. The yelling, the rage. That's bad enough, but then, then to be beaten with rods. Being far removed and historically distant, we are prone to take in this incident without much emotion at all. But I want you to see that here was a large number of people rising up against Paul and Silas. This was a mob incited by the devil himself. And this vast crowd, they were full of hatred and violence. And they beat Paul and Silas. They were flogged, beaten with rods. This was a Roman punishment of scour scourging, which could be used both for chastisement or for torture during interrogation, though not with Roman citizens. The word for stripes is the same as to beat. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. The inner prison, probably what we would call the dungeon, the darkest and most secure cell in the place. The stench must have been overwhelming. Their bleeding backs lying exposed to the damp and cold ground probably sapped what heat they had left in their bodies, most likely causing them to shiver. It's sometimes uncontrollably. And made their feet fast in the stalk. The stalks were two large pieces of wood pierced with holes and fitted to each other that when the legs were in them, they could not be drawn out. And the holes being pierced at different distances, the legs might be separate to a great extent, which would produce at sometimes extreme pain. In this circumstance, to which it is supposed that Aurelius Clemens Prudentius, an early Christian poet, refers in speaking of the torments of Vincent. He said they placed his feet in the stocks and his legs greatly distented. 
When Catherine Evans, a Quaker heroine of the 17th century, was imprisoned within the gloomy walls of the Inquisition in the island of Malta for obeying what she regarded as a call from God to preach the gospel in the East, she was put in an inner room of the Inquisition, which had only two little holes in it for light and air, and which was so exceedingly hot that it seemed to be the intention to stifle her. On one occasion, Friar Malachi told her unless she abandoned her religion, she should never go out of that room alive. To this, she fearlessly replied, the Lord is sufficient to deliver me, but whatever he will or not, I will not forsake the living fountain to drink at a broken sister. What a powerful response. The Lord is sufficient to deliver me, but whether he will or not, I will not forsake the living fountain to drink at a broken cistern. In like manner, Paul and Silas, when apprehended and thrust into this inner prison at Philippi, were not debarred thereby from praising and preaching Christ. To such men indeed, stone walls do not make a prison, nor iron bars a cage. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation, paraphrase Bible. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure, being the Holy Spirit. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. You see, the preparation for God's work was through affliction. Starting with Jesus, the apostles, and throughout history, missionaries, pastors, and believers have had to endure much affliction, much suffering, and even death in some places. The devil does not give up without a fight. This fallen world is his domain, and the people under his influence, without experiencing the saving power of Jesus, will continue to oppose the gospel message in those who preach it and those who live it. Why? Because the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And many believers throughout the world can identify with these words of Paul. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Once a great scholar in China said, a sage seeks opportunities and difficulties, and a fool finds difficulties and opportunities. We are born to overcome difficulties through the power of the Holy Spirit. Eileen Egan, who worked with Mother Teresa and with the missionaries of charity for 30 years, described Mother Teresa, her outlook like this. One day after my conservation had been filled with a litany of problems, Mother Teresa remarked, everything is a problem. Why not use the word gift? Would that begin a shift in vocabulary? Shortly thereafter, we were to fly from Vancouver to New York City. I was dismayed to learn that the trip had to be broken en route with a long delay and was about to inform her of the problem. Then I caught myself and said, Mother, I have to tell you about a gift. We have to wait four hours here, and you won't arrive at the convent until late, very late. Mother Teresa settled down in the airport to read a book of meditations, a favorite of hers. From that time on, items that presented disappointments or difficulties would be introduced with, we have a small gift here. 
or today we have an especially big gift, a change of vocabulary, a change of attitude, looking at opposition, looking at trouble, looking at trials as gifts, as opportunities. So lying there on the cold, damp, dank floor, Paul and Silas began to pray and to praise God. The hour of prayer and worship is midnight. The temple is a prison. The conductors of the service are Paul and Silas, and with great bodily pain, they proceeded to be lead worshipers. Even in pain, they became lead worshipers. Number one, circumstances of difficulty are occasions to worship the Lord. Circumstances of difficulty are occasions to worship the Lord. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Psalm 42, 8, and 11, 8 through 11. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. They sang praises praises. They celebrated God. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. As the word here employed is that it's used to denote that, that a paschal hymn that was sung by our Lord and his disciples after their, their last Passover. In Matthew 26, 26 through 30, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You see, letter A, Jesus is proof that the human spirit can triumph in all things. He knew what was coming. He knew what was about to happen to him, and yet he became a lead worshiper. He knew what he was going to go through. The betrayal of Judas, the scattering of the disciples, the denial of Peter, the torture and death, and the separation never known in the Godhead. Yet he did not falter. He stood on the promises of the Father's word. The hymns sung by Jesus and the disciples are known to consist of Psalms 113 through 118, which were chanted at the Passover festival. Psalm 118, 22 through 26. The stone the builders are just read has one of them. become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, O Lord. Save us, O Lord. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what they sang. This is what Jesus sang. This is what Paul and Silas most likely sang. Though Paul and Silas have been tortured in their pain and suffering, their spirits under the influence of the Holy Spirit rose above their situation, rose above their situation, and they worship the Lord with all their hearts. Life is unpredictable. Things change. Nations rise and fall. Economies collapse. Physical bodies decay. Yet in the midst of earthly chaos, God's word and the promises it contains are unshakable. All of us at one time or another will face difficulties in our life. And we will be given moments to mature as we stand on God's promises and rise above our situations. 
and if need be, lead when we worship. Yes, we're called to be his ambassadors, his representatives, as if he was making his appeal to us. And that's through the circumstances of our lives. Which brings us to point two. The time is approaching that you may be called to participate in the sufferings of Christ. The time is approaching that you may be called to participate in the sufferings of Christ. Peter in his first epistle says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. It's been said in these midnight hymns by the imprisoned witnesses for Jesus Christ, the whole might of Roman injustice and violence against the church is not only set at naught, but converted into a foil to set forth more completely the majesty and the spiritual power of the church, which as yet the world knew nothing of. And if the sufferings of these two witnesses for Christ are the beginning and the type of numberless martyrdoms which were to flow upon the church from the same source... In like manner, the unparalleled triumph of the spirit over suffering was the beginning and the pledge of a spiritual power, which we afterwards see shining forth so triumphantly and irresistibly in the many martyrs of Christ who were given up as a prey to that same imperial might of Rome. And it hasn't stopped. It has not stopped. There is still suffering in the name of Jesus to this very moment as I speak. And there are those that are rising above their circumstances because they recognize the power that's within them, jars of clay, same power that raised Christ from the dead is with them to rise above their circumstances. You see, number three, circumstances of difficulty are divine opportunities to witness. Circumstances of difficulty are a divine opportunity to witness, to witness to others, to be a testimony, to speak loudly of your faith. So at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And the prisoners heard them. The jail was full of thieves, murderers, outcasts, lawbreakers, and a public servant of a pagan idol-worshiping empire. They are locked into the jail. They cannot go anywhere. They are a captive audience and they will not be late for the early morning worship service. <laughs> Note that Paul and Silas were not complaining. They were praying and praising. Furthermore, they were not even aware that they were testifying. The scripture states the prisoners heard their prayers and praise and doubtless with astonishment. Prayer and praise were not a prison practice. The song of rejoicing in the language of praise is, is not usual among men lying bound in a dungeon. What were the prisoners hearing? What were they thinking? This has never happened before. And their hearts must have been stirred by the worship service. Jesus said that he came to set the captive free, to set the prisoner free. Spiritually, the Holy Spirit was working in the hearts of those prisoners to accomplish his will. 
And those prisoners not only witnessed the worship of God in spirit and in truth, but they were about to witness the incredible power of God. Notice the, the, the title of this message, Pain, Praise, and Power. You see, number four, there are times that the Lord will back up his word with supernatural interventions. So the prisoners heard them. They're listening in. Their hearts are being stirred. And then suddenly, Scripture says, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Can you imagine this? Just try to picture this in your mind. Paul and Silas, through their pain, rising above their circumstances, praising God for who he is, praising him for his glory and his majesty, the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and they're singing out the praises in the midnight hour. And the place was shaken physically shaken to the point that all at once, every single prison door flew open and everybody's chains fell off. All the prisoners witnessed the power of God, just as they witnessed the prayer and the praise of God's servants. Paul, being in step with the Holy Spirit, knew that it was a miracle. And he also knew it was a door, open door to share the gospel. Shaken means to topple, to stir. Not only was the foundations of that jail shaken, but the foundations of the hearts that were in that prison were shaken. Adam Clark says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And in consequence of this, they spoke the word of God with boldness, a pointed answer to a second part of their request. Though these disciples had received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, yet they were capable of larger communications. And what they had then received did not preclude the necessity of frequent supplies on emergent occasions. Indeed, one communion of this spirit always makes way and disposes for another. Neither apostle nor private Christian can subsist in the divine life without frequent influences from on high. And that's a commentary on when Peter and John were released from prison. And it says, they went back to their own people. And it says, and they prayed. And the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They had another filling of the Holy Spirit. In Philippi, after the quake, the things that strikes me most is what I see in this story is that the doors flew open and the chains were loosed. This is a twofold deliverance. A, God has provided open doors and loose chains, but man must choose to leave the prison. God has provided open doors and loose chains, but man must choose to leave the prison. Spiritually speaking, the Lord has defeated Satan. He has provided for man through the earth-shaken miracle of Christ's death and resurrection. When he died, the earth, there was an earthquake. When he rose again, there was an earthquake. He has provided deliverance by the open door of salvation and the power to break the chains of sin and enslavement. But man must choose to leave the prison. And he must also choose wisely as to not be incarcer incarcerated again. But in, the, but in Philippi, the story is just a tad different. Letter B, God's intent was not so much the physical deliverance of those involved, but the spiritual deliverance of the jailer and his family and also the prisoners. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Now, if that sounds strange to you, 
The law of Roman military stated that if a guard lost a prisoner, he was given the same punishment the prisoner would have received. No doubt the jailer thought he would be facing a death penalty. And because of the cruelties of Roman execution, the jailer would rather take his own life. And Paul knew something about the jailer that the other prisoners did not know. Listen to this, letter C. The jailer was the real prisoner. Let that sink in. Paul knew that. The jailer, he was the real prisoner. Enslaved to the enemy of his soul, enslaved to an umpire that was wicked. And the jailer called for lights and he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Incredible. Why would he come up with that? What must I do to be saved? Why would he say something like that if he didn't witness Paul and Silas at some point before they were arrested preach about Jesus? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. <laughs> From pain to praise to power to proselytizing to preaching. D, the foundational constant in this life is the authoritative dependability of God's word. They were singing God's word. They were preaching God's word. The place was shaken because of God's word. The place was shaken because of praise. The place was shaking. And doors flew open. And chains fell off. And hearts were open because of God's word. God's word is dependable authoritative and powerful. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. Can you imagine this? In the early morning hours, he took them, he washed their wounds, took them back to his house. And then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole family. Can you imagine that? He was the real prisoner. He was the real one that got set free that day. And his house with him. Can you imagine? And they joined Lydia and became part of a house church, a new church a New Testament church. Remember, the Lord gave Paul a vision. And again, with the salvation of the jailer and his family, along with any servants becoming believers and anyone in the jail, was confirmation of the vision and the word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The circumstances may not be according to the way you would do things, but then again, as Scripture states, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from the heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And just a word of caution about the jailer's family being saved. Many people have taken this out of context and used it for themselves and their family. Just be careful. Warren Wearsby says, it is in this passage, it's so-called household salvation is refuted. Children cannot be saved simply because their parents are saved, nor are infants or unbelieving children to be baptized. 
The promise of salvation was to all of the jailer's household. The preaching was heard by the household. All the household was baptized, but it was because all the household believed. By no stretch of the imagination can we conceive of infants understanding the word and believing. But I also believe that those infants, even if they died, they would be in the presence of God. When a man opens his heart to Christ, his, show, his, his home should be opened as well. And that's what the jailer did. And all those that were of believing age, ages of accountability, heard and received Christ as Lord and Savior and were baptized. Pretty amazing. Not only did joy accompany the miracle of salvation, but the jailer washed their wounds, brought them to his house, fed them a meal, something that would have never happened. And with joy, the jailer and his family were baptized. And this was in the early morning hours before daylight. Add to this, it is not mentioned how many of the prisoners came to believe in Jesus. I can't help but believe that they all did. Pain, praise, power. Pain, praise, power. May we all rise above our circumstances and become lead worshipers and preachers and with testimony bring others to Christ.